Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's podcast broadcast of This Week in Science. We are ready to have an incredibly good time. I hope you are as well. Trace, are you ready for a good show? I'm ready for a good show. Okay, me too. I'm ready. I hope the chats are ready. Into the stream, everyone. Yes, Schnago. Yes, everyone. Hope the volumes are all good. I don't know why. Everybody always says I'm quieter than everyone else, so it's just me whispering all the time. But this is the part of the show where I tell you that this is live as we're doing this. So if we make mistakes, if there are oopses and uh ohs and technical difficulties, then hopefully the editor will ed edit them out for the podcast. Uh, but in the meantime, what you're seeing on the YouTubes, the Facebook, Facebook is and the Twitch is the real live thing that we're doing unedited. And so that's just the way it is, everybody. <sighs> make sure you hit the hearts, the likes, the thumbs up, the shares, the notifications, the bells, the ringings, and it's the holiday season. So ah, time to start to start the show. For wow, real. that was a mistake. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that gets cut out entirely. <laughs> All right. Beginning this show in three, two, this is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode number 954, recorded on Wednesday, December 13th, 2023, How to Use Emojis for Science. Hey, everybody, I'm Dr. Kiki. Welcome to the show. Tonight, we will fill your heads with mouse VR, carnivorous cats, and brain aware. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Lo, as I sit at the silicon computer, thinking thoughts in an organic stupor, what to my visual senses should appear, but more stories about our world for all to hold dear. Though some tales may cause fear, we'll make it clear that all that we might learn is rarely cause for concern, except for maybe some of those really scary things like infectious viruses and malicious AI and, you, you know, stuff like that, whatever. As science is a great tool, and you aren't a fool, because you are listening to This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries. everyone welcome to another episode of this week in science we are so glad that you are here joining us once again we have a great show ahead and we are joined by an amazing guest host trace dominguez who really actually does just about everything related to creating science programs for the world explaining science, making people like science, like going, sh shaking them and saying, man, you like science now. <laughs> Trace, thanks for joining us. Welcome yeah, to thanks the show. for having me. This is awesome. I haven't been on Twisted so long. I'm really excited to be back. It's been a while. So it's wonderful to get you back on the show. <sighs> and we have so many fun things to get into. What did I bring? I have science news about uh, brain computers rock walls, snake eyes, mice in VR, and always more brains, lots of brains. Trace, did you bring some stories too? I did. Um, I brought a, sh a bit about the Geminids, which are currently in the sky, uh, peaking this week. Uh, so that's exciting. I brought a story about cats that kill everything. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And then I brought uh, a bit about the United States' plan for particle physics over the next 20 years, which is pretty cool. I am excited to learn more about that because what have we been 
Yeah, mean, exactly. I mean, like, I'm just excited we have a plan. <laughs> we like, I think that, that's important. <laughs> it's, it's always important to have a plan. <laughs> oh my gosh! Otherwise, what are you doing, man? Yeah, come on. I mean, you gotta have a plan. That's like I mean, the older I get, the more I'm like, if you are thinking ahead at all, we can be friends. Just like a little bit. Okay. I'm glad we could be friends. I have a whole rundown of things. So we have a plan so we could do the show and not be like, it. what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> it's not particle physics, but you know, it's it's a plan for tonight. It's all it works good. now. And then, works. you know, that's great. <laughs> It's all good right now, and I hope it'll be good for everyone into the future. As we jump into the show, we would love you to know, I want you to know, that you can subscribe to this podcast. All places that podcasts are found pretty much. Look for This Week in Science, The Twist Podcast. We broadcast weekly, 8 p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And so there's videos there. You can subscribe to our channels there. If there's a lot of stuff that I'm telling you about right now and you just are like, blah, 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 words, then go to our website, twist.org. That's where you'll find all the things that you really need. Okay. Are we ready to jump into this episode? I'm ready. Okay. It's time for the science. Mouse brains. Love them. What do delicious. we know about them? Really oh. delicious. <laughs> 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 that was not what I was expecting. All right. Big story this week. Um, I've talked about mouse brains quite a lot on this program through the years. And within the last week, researchers published in Nature nine articles. That's a lot. That are delivering the results of a six-year-long effort. The Seattle's Allen Institute had a lead role. Also, uh, there are the Broad Institute, Harvard, Salk Institute for Biological Studies, University of California, San Diego, UC Berkeley, all sorts of universities involved in trying to look more deeply into the mouse brain and figure out what cells are there and which cells are where. And they have in this compendium of studies uh, put together uh, the first complete multimodal cell atlas for the mouse brain. Wow. That's cool. I'm looking at it right now. It's so cool. Yeah. So it's it's very cool. Um, not only, you know, it's like, oh, there's like neurons in there and stuff. But this is looking at exactly what kinds of neurons are in different places. We also know that there are... Uh, glial cells, astrocytes, other cells that are support cells, what functions do they hold in different places? And so really this is a reference list for, for the brain, for the mouse brain itself. And in addition to this, they've done gene sequencing, which is pretty exciting because now it's not just what cells are where, but, oh, we've got a cell that is like a dopamine producing cell, but it's in different parts of the brain and different genes are being expressed in these different parts of the brain. So it gives, starts to give a reasoning as to why different things happen in the mouse brain in different places. Wow. One of the things that was uh, really exciting about this particular uh, effort is that they discovered a really strong correlation between this gene expression and patterns for cell types and where they're found in the brain. And so they say that the older regions, the lower or ventral regions of the brain, what we, you would consider as maybe more evolutionarily distant to where we are now, mm -hmm. uh, there's more and more diverse, distinct cell types they're also closely related to each other. So there's like a lot of evolution that's happened in that kind of ancient ventral part of the brain that takes wow. care of a lot of our instinctual reactions to things. That's cool. Yeah. And so then the more recently evolved part of the brain, we have a lot of those cell types, a lot of the gene expression and stuff that's happened, but it's, it's, it's not quite as diverse, not as distinct 
as what is earlier. And so 80% um, of the regulatory elements that are unique to humans are transposable elements. So that these are things that are changing positions within the genome. And this is not what they, def uh, what they really found within the mouse brain. And so they're thinking that we can start looking at what we're finding in the mouse brain now with this atlas and what they're learning about the human brain and start to figure out maybe why certain diseases occur. Mm. Why, why is there, you know, why is there uh, neurodegeneration in certain, uh, in certain brains? Uh, what are the gaps that we have between different mammalian species? What happened? Why did these transposable elements allow us to have the cognitive functions that we have that other, I mean, there are lots of cognitive functions that we underestimate and other animals going to say that, but um, being able to really figure out those genetic factors at play and cool. where different cells are. Yeah. That's neat. When, yeah. when did this start? When did this all start? Yeah. So this is uh, something that started about six years ago and this uh, has been, been ongoing. Uh, they, yeah, just, they, they, there are previous studies that they call from the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, which is, I've had it up on the screen, the Bicken. The Bicken. The Bicken. I feel like they could have come up with a better. <laughs> Their acronym. You know? You mm. don't think, mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, Brain Initiative is already B-R-A-I-N, so Brian, Brain. Briny. Brain. <laughs> the Brain CCNE. Brain CC net. I don't know. CC net. But yeah, that's super neat. Wow. This reminds me, do you think this is as impactful outside of this field? Or is this something where within the, the mouse brain studying field, they're going to, everybody's going to read this and be like, wow, this is amazing. And it's applicable. So what I think is that they, um, this is exciting for the mouse brain field. Uh, but beyond that, it is exciting for just understanding evolutionary aspects of our relatedness to other species, how the brain functions, how neurons have evolved over time to create different or allow different functions to take place. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's the kind of situation where, yeah, the the mouse brain people are going to be very excited about this, but I really think that uh, the human brain scientists who study neuronal architecture and the, especially the genetics, yeah, is they're going to be the most excited about it. Yeah, I mean, looking at the article here about it, it it's fascinating because they said here that you know it's going to be helpful, like you say, to treat diseases and disorders that are common across different mammalian brains. Which that, I don't know, that kind of blows my mind a little bit. And that's the hope, right? That we could actually get to a point where we could treat different disorders, multiple sclerosis, maybe Alzheimer's, maybe uh, Parkinson's disease. Maybe you know, there are so many different disorders that are based on, like Parkinson's specifically, we know they're, uh, it's based on dopamine, dopaminergic neurons. And you know those are throughout the brain, but maybe mm -hmm. they have different different targets for therapeutics in different areas of the brain that would be important. Yeah, that could be cool. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And it says here, you know, we've obviously we're different than mice, clearly. But yeah, multiple sclerosis. <laughs> and Are we not mice? Nervosa. Even this one kind of stuck out to me is that, that they said it might be able to work with people who have addiction behaviors um, and problems with addiction. You know, they specifically call out tobacco addiction. But, you know, that that it would be pretty incredible to get a little bit of our mammalian insight to be able to help people break those addiction cycles. And, you know, that my, my backgrounds in behavioral psychology. So okay. that I find that very interesting because that's something that, you know, behaviorists work on all the time. It'd be cool if we could just get into the brain and be like, figure that out. Got it. Not that, right. you know, put people out of jobs, but that's okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> fix people instead. <laughs> no, I don't think this will put people out of jobs. I think it's, this is going to, you know, lead to more questions, which I think mm. is, you know, the biggest ask, you know, the biggest thing. It's like, okay, it's like I, you grew up with maybe, I mean, I grew up with Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, those shelf full, you know, A to Z, uh, looking through it and it had information in it, but it didn't have all the information. And I always read those little sections yeah. going, I feel like there's more yeah. and I'm missing something here. Yeah. I had a world book. Same. I was just like, dad, the B book isn't very big. There's a lot of stuff. This B, there's more stuff here. What's going on? Yeah, same. So I think that's the best part about science like this, where it's like this compendium of basic science that comes together is it opens up a lot more questions. It makes a new baseline, you know, where you can like, okay, well, if we refer to this map, now we can start to build new studies based on what they've discovered, which is just the best. And we've been discovering so much recently, uh, you know, stories we've talked about on the show related to just our increasing understanding that the brain isn't just like, oh, boop, boop, neuronal network. That's all it is. There's there are all these other cells involved that do short distance and even help with long distance transmission of signals and modify signals. And so it's this much more complicated system. So now that we start to see this, maybe we can see more about, I don't know. We did it for mice. Woohoo! Mouse Ooh. Atlas, brains. Yay. We Who's love next? them. Well, <laughs> yes. I don't Doggies? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but to do all this, you know, I'm sure it is powered by coffee. Oh, yes, definitely. Mm, yes. So much. Are you, a, are you a coffee drinker? I love coffee. I love it. It's, <laughs> um, I like it not for the reason that some, some people drink coffee for caffeine. I have ADHD, so I don't. I drink it for oh. the ritual. The like, I'm going to take a minute. And I'm going to make some coffee. You know, it's just like that is nice. It's And it's, it's a scene setting for you. And it's a way yeah. to like start right. to separate moments. Mm -hmm. So right. I make a coffee, huh. I make a smoothie. I sit down and start my day. And I've done that since for now for like more than 10 years. You know, I just didn't really drink coffee before I had a nine to five that started at <laughs> 7 a.m. And I would be like, okay, well, I'm going to go and have a warm beverage in the morning. And so yeah. it's really the more morning, that morning warm beverage. What, so what, what about people, you? Do you drink coffee? I do. I really enjoy my morning cup of coffee. And I, I am a special, I, I, I am a lucky, lucky person. My husband brings me my cup of coffee in bed in the morning. Oh, wow. That's love. It is, except for the part where he has all of the lights in the house attached to his app. And so he turns the lights in my room on. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay. That seems like a thing we can update. Okay, fine. But the coffee, it's wonderful. And I love the coffee in the morning, the smell, the taste. And I know there are a lot of people who really enjoy the coffee for the ritual and also the caffeine. But there is a question about uh, where these caffeinated beverages may come from in the future as mm. climate change is potentially endangering the ecosystems in which the coffee plants are grown. That's right. Yeah. So what else do researchers do but say, let's make it in a Petri dish. <laughs> Lab grown <laughs> coffee? Lab grown coffee. So this week uh, in uh, the Association of Chemical Science, ACS. I always forget oh, their yeah. acronym. Yes. Is it the American Chemical Society? That, that would be the one. Thank you very much. Oh, good. I <laughs> yes, did it. I've, I've worked with them before, been to their meetings. <laughs> acronyms give, I don't know, acronyms, whatever. There's a lot of acronyms. <sighs> anyway, in their publication this last week, researchers uh, reported on their work creating coffee out of coffee cells. Hmm. They took cool. leaves from uh, coffee plants and they uh, cultured them, got them into a cellular level, uh, cultured the cells that were in those little bits of coffee plant, created freeze dried coffee cells. So now it's like, um, I don't know, the European freeze dried coffee at this point, I guess. Um, they, <laughs> they roasted those cells that had been freeze dried 
and then brewed them as coffee. And then they compared them against regular coffees and unroasted coffee cells to see how the flavor profiles, the chemistry profiles, how everything uh, changed. Hmm. And it, That's they, cool. I like yeah. that in the study they, they mention sample preparation and serving for sensory analysis. <laughs> sensory. <laughs> Does it actually taste and smell like real coffee? Uh, it, it, it's close. It's not quite. They said overall it, would, it, it did a pretty good job. Um, there were some aspects of the flavor missing, hmm. according to the researchers. So there's uh, some of the, the, I guess, the, the phytoproteins, the, the, the aspects of a full plant that's been grown within mm -hmm. a particular, as we'll use the, the wine term, terroir, uh, yeah. so that the plant is influenced by the soil, is influenced by the waters, all the things that are going on there. But um, they determined that uh, they were able to uh, create basically a cellular coffee that's kind of like freeze-dried coffee. It's not exactly perfect, uh, but they, they it gave them something to start with, and they think they did a pretty good job. Hmm. Yeah. It says low bitterness intensity that they weirdly gave them unroasted, which I guess maybe that's like a control. So it would be like unroasted coffee beans as opposed yeah. to the roasted coffee beans. And right. we know that there is a difference in the flavor profile of roasted versus unroasted coffee mm -hmm. beans. You don't want to yeah. drink coffee that hasn't been roasted. Mm -mm. Um, no, no, no. They Nothing. saw that their coffee cell culture is less toxic. Oh, <laughs> than well, <rain>. that's nice. <laughs> Just a bit, you know. They're looking, looking at it, and they said, "Hey, let's use shrimp, Daphnia magna. Let's put them in this water and let them try and live with coffee." And uh, they compared how well different samples of shrimp lived on different coffee <laughs> samples <laughs> well i wouldn't have that i'm allergic to shrimp so i can't oh, no. that would that would That's make it not <laughs> feeling to me it said not the taste helping. attributes the roasted cell coffees had comparable intensities of bitterness rated 5.5 yes. to 6.5 interesting and sourness to conventional coffee which i think is Interesting. And that's where you want to get. I mean, there's a the, the flavor of coffee and what people want to drink as coffee. It, you don't want it too bitter, but sometimes different people like more bitter coffee. I like a, I like a good dark yeah. roast, but yeah. um, if it's too bitter, I'm not, I don't really like it that much. But anyway. That's cool. That's really cool. I love yeah. it. I would try it. I would definitely try it. I, I would feel try like it. It can't be worse than some of the coffee out there. You know, there's some terrible coffee out there and it can't be worse than that. I'm not going to name names of I places that have terrible coffee, but Me either. <laughs> we're all thinking it. it's out there. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, cool. the, the question is, yeah, is this the kind of thing that people will uh, adapt to is, you know, as we lose, <sighs> Yeah, I hate to think of climate change making real coffee beans less accessible, coffee more expensive. But at the same time, uh, can we create mm -hmm. something that could work for people uh, on spaceships in outer space? Yeah, I mean, yes, there's definitely. <laughs> I, I I think this, this is one of those things that we've been talking about in the science community science communication community for years, right, is that climate change isn't an existential crisis for people who are experiencing it already, places where sea level is already rising, Micronesia, all these other places where you have to worry about, you know, islands in the Pacific, you know, these nations are losing land now. And like, there are things like chocolate, wine, coffee, places that where they're grown in specific climates that they can't be grown other places. <laughs> That's why we grow it in like, Brazil yeah. and, you know, northern South America and in Hawaii because it needs to rain a lot. It needs to have enough water for to grow these plants, but it also needs to be warm enough. And it's just like there's not that many places on Earth where you can grow good coffee. So either we all yeah. have to get used to terrible coffee. No. 
grown in a so... hydroponics bay somewhere on Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> right. Or, you know, we got to go or, like this, I guess. It might become, yeah. Coffee coming wow. from a lab near you. That's cool. Yeah. Um, also really cool it, from Science Advances this last week, researchers uh, were studying the Great Wall of China. Oh. And uh, the Great Wall of China, it's one of those wonders of the planet. Humans built this massive, massive structure, structure like They were thousands. planning ahead. That's what yeah. they were doing. They thousands were planning ahead. Thousands of years ahead. ago, right? And they built it over a... a an extreme distance, like the, just the, you know, it's visible from space, right? It's 8,851.8 kilometers across varying ecosystems, mostly dry land. But one of the questions is, okay, in the different places where it was built, they used different substances. A lot of it was rammed earth, like taking the earth from nearby, shoving it together and making, Yes. Yeah. Big bricks. Um, others, it was stone that had been dug from uh, nearby quarries. Uh, so these researchers uh, looked at <laughs> what's eroding the Great Wall of China. And oh. yeah, what I think is super exciting about <laughs> the erosion of the Great Wall of China, I don't think that came out well, um, was... Uh, this particular story that uh, bio crusts, what living organisms on the surface of the stone or the rammed earth, the surface of the wall itself, help prevent erosion. Neat. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. They like hold it together. Yeah, so they were looking at bacterial biocrusts, they were looking at lichen, they were looking oh, yeah, yeah. at mosses, they were looking at all sorts of things, and uh, comparing the preserved sections from the deteriorated sections, and they found that certain sections were doing a lot better than others, and uh, the ones that were doing better had these biocrusts on them, hmm. and uh, the mosses were actually like the best preservers of the wall. Hmm, that's like interesting. In, yeah, so the bacteria, they did okay. But uh, so they were looking at like how porous they were, how much water capacity they had for holding the strength of this, this crusty structure, uh, how stable they were, how much they eroded salinity, all that kind of stuff, and uh, really determined that yeah, if they didn't have a lot of uh, little roots and filaments, rhizoids, other things, going into the wall, which could then de help deteriorate the wall, and were just really just on the surface, uh, they were better at reducing erosion. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, especially cool because things like lichen as a as like a, a mold product i guess is more associated with decay we usually yes. associate that thing with oh this is this is helping break down this felled tree or whatever so the fact that it's also in this case sort of the opposite helping keep it up that's pretty awesome that's and, really cool yeah and so the interesting there it, it, thing here is that it was more beneficial to the rammed earth sections mm. than to the stone sections oh the stone sections the lichen was more deteriorating as opposed to um the other things that they looked at but uh wow. yeah so oh, this is neat it says they were next time stronger. you build a wall put a pie crust on it made of <laughs> mosses lichens cyanobacteria okay <laughs> what were you gonna say <laughs> i said it says here in this physorg piece uh they found the bio crusts were stronger than the rammed earth material upon which they were growing yes in some cases three times stronger yeah wow wow That's right cool. and you would it's really cool so it makes you start thinking about okay what are we building now and then of course as every person does i mean mostly men apparently according to the internet you immediately go to, to roman concrete of and course. you okay. <laughs> Yeah, what's going on with them Romans? What was that concrete, the self-healing aspect of that concrete? What was going on there? And uh, 
what can we do moving forward with our more sustainable concretes that we're going to come up with, hopefully, how can we make them stronger, but also potentially allow them to uh, be made stronger by these biological processes? Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't. This is, this is just neat to me. I don't know anything about lichens. I like them. Don't know anything about them. I like seeing them out in the, in the woods when I'm out in the woods. I like a lichen. I've never been to the Great Wall of China. Have you been to the Great Wall of China? I've never been. I yeah. haven't. I know people who have been. So, you know, I'm like, you know, one degree away from people who've been there. There and you like go. Put their photos on social media. But yeah. That's neat. Yeah. So, is this something where they you think... I feel like if I were going to build a really big wall that I knew was going to keep out the, uh, well, the hordes, work, but that's okay. The hordes, yeah. I would just, you know, you just put some lichen on it now. Just when you first build it, you put the lichen on it, slap some lichen on there. Be like, do your thing, pal. And then come back 3000 <laughs> years later and be like, Hey, did it work? <laughs> oh, you, you work. The wall's still here. That's great. Oh, people climbed you. That's good. Apparently, you didn't build a wall like they did. Oh, no. Game of Thrones, they didn't have a big enough ice wall either. So anyway, never mind. (laughs) It doesn't Uh, matter how big that wall is. No. (laughs) They got dragons. They got fire-breathed dragons. Uh, But then we also have sea snakes. Hmm. Sea snakes. uh, The dragons of the sea, as they're called. (laughs) (laughs) by you uh reported in the royal society open science uh mccary university researchers with uh, the australian institute of marine science have been looking at what are called the epicerine sea snakes they're venomous they're in the indo-pacific region they used to live on land but then went to the sea they tend to live in coral reef areas they hunt fish and crustaceans uh they're not uh, they don't have gills they're not like fish they are they have to like dolphins rise to the surface take a big breath of air and then hold it and go down and do their hunting um so these yeah kind of neat they're holding their breath and then yeah they go after their their prey with their venom um so researchers are like what are you doing down there how'd you evolve to get how do you do this what's going on and the researchers are really interested in this uh they found that there is species dimorph dimorphism between males and females females are larger Mm -hmm. males are a little bit smaller um and the males have really big eyes Oh, better to see you with, my dear. Exactly. And that is the hypothesis that these researchers have uh, actually put forward based on their <laughs> their study of the physiology of 419 preserved samples of six species. Uh, they, they think that uh, the larger eyes allowed them to see underwater better, allowed them to hunt better. Better, but also because the females didn't have the larger eyes, the females just are bigger than the males, that it allows them to see the females better. Mm. And so Interesting. those big eyes allow them to find potential mates under the water. Uh, and um, But the marine environment may have had an influence on this. Huh. And the, how about don't snakes have the Jacobson's organ to smell things as well. How would that work underwater? I feel like maybe I the have eyes z- help. <laughs> I have zero idea how, yeah. how that would work. Yeah. And that's so neat because they're, they're very scenty. Um, right. Yeah. On land they are. But uh, if they're holding their breath underwater, then they're yeah. probably not doing scenting. Uh, and so the, the big eyeballs must be like, oh, I think there's somebody over there. Let's go get them. See, go, see if they're see if they're uh, you know into the same things I'm into. You know, coffee and stuff. Yeah. Coffee. How are you and doing? Oh, can, do you you like this lichen? I like this lichen. Let's go. I I caught a fish. You like that fish? It's a good fish. Hey good there, fishing. You, you heard about the lichens on the Great Wall of China? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and she's like, uh uh-uh, uh, nope, not interested. Nope. I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna close my eyes, turn around, pretend I never saw you. <laughs> swim away, swim away. Swim. Just keep swimming, hun. Just keep swimming <laughs> until I have to surface and breathe. That's funny. Wow. Yeah. So uh, also the the size difference between the uh, the males and the females is uh, most likely because there is not a lot of competition between the males for the females. Oh. So the males are like, eh, whatever, whatever, whatever. They're just out there hunting for females when it's time to mate. They don't fight between. So each it, other. it literally is like if you can't find one. <laughs> you're out of luck so that would make sense that they would need yeah. since they can't use their scent they have to use bigger eyeballs to go and find other snakes because if they don't find them then they just live a lonely life and they're going to start you know texting their best friends sad face emojis <laughs> oh the emojis and this is where we talk about emojis oh wait no i have one more thing to add on here before the emojis though um uh, reported in the journal Personality and Individual Differences, uh, <laughs> researchers uh, surveyed people about how they thought about guys and luxury cars, oh. and what their feelings on luxury cars were. Um, and uh, basically, men who drive expensive cars attract women looking for her, a partner who can provide them with a certain level of lifestyle, but it hadn't been tested really. These two surveys, uh, they had the first 171 responses, 93 from women, and then they did another survey, 409 responses, 206 from women. They found that both men and women view driving luxury ve vehicles as better, as higher mating value. Hmm. So if you are not a sea snake with big eyes, Maybe you need to buy a luxury car. Yeah, go out and buy a really nice car. Don't, I mean, I have a Kia. That's pretty nice. Yeah. I just, but I, I don't think I'm attracting the mates that would give me a you don't need fancy to lifestyle any, with a Kia. You don't need to anymore. That's you're, true. I'm married. You're, I don't a, need you're to. a family man. So. Got a baby. Yeah. You got a great partner and a baby, and everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> But this is one of these things that's like social psychology stuff, like where I'm like, why are people like this? Where it's yeah. like, you have a nice car and survey says that means you're more intelligent. Mm -hmm. People think you're more intelligent because you have a nice car and they would benefit from personal intimate relationships with that person who has a nice car. And I just want to, I just, I feel like the reality is very different. Yeah. I find this interesting. Most of these are these surveys are self-reported, right? They're self-reporting this like I would feel I'm yeah. responding to a survey about this and it's like luxury car survey, you know. Um Tell me I do how you feel would like feel. there's probably some core some a little bit of like skewing that. But that's okay. I do think it for some people it would be the opposite, right? You drive a luxury car in your I don't know, 40s or whatever, and you're like, rawr, rawr, rawr. we always, everyone makes fun of those people. They're just like, you are, your genitalia is not larger for having driven such a car. If that it's, is, how is that, that how's value. that, how's that midlife crisis going there? Right. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> what is, why, why? Look, I get it. You want to drive a nice, comfortable car? Do that. But it's great. Come on. Come yeah. On. Come on. Yeah, I mean, still, this is, you know, it's, they had 409 responses, they did a couple surveys, surveys are biased, they did the best they could, but at the same time, people, people, people. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. I love that kind of social science. Yeah, I just, I, I'm like, who are the people who responded to the survey and what is happening there? Yeah, I'm skimming through the the, the study, but I don't have access to the pdf unfortunately i haven't had enough time to look into it but oh man it's so interesting you'll you can dig deeper later I'll dig deep. but now we can talk about the emojis and is there an emoji for digging i don't know, I don't know. trace do you use emojis a lot in your oh, uh, yes. communications are you an emoji communicator 
I like emojis, but I usually use them for emphasis. So I'll text somebody like a sentence or a paragraph and I'll put like an emoji at the end to be like, this is the emotion that I'm tagging this message with. But I don't like replace words with emojis. I'm not like, right. oh, hello, you know, friend, here's this. I need a chicken, you know, like I'm not going to I would just say I need a chicken. I wouldn't put the chicken. Emoji. I get when people do that, but it feels a little like Mad Libs to me. Like you're trying or to the, it's what harder was it? to it, parse. Is it anagrams where like where you that like gets the pictures and you have to figure out what the words are that are like. Trying, oh, yeah. Do you remember those puzzles like, like would, I feel like this used to be puzzles and yeah. people are using them like real conversation all the time now. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When it's like B for and they use the B instead of the word B, they're saving one character. So that's the thing that bugs me. Also, the emoji keyboard doesn't show as many emojis as you would need to make all of the. So you're actually working harder to type only with emojis than if you were just typing B -E. typing because you have to search for each emoji. But OK, people use but, emojis. You know, maybe we're just old. Maybe we're just old now. I feel like I might be, but uh, regardless, people use emojis a lot, and there's been a lot of research into the accuracy of emojis in uh, providing context and providing emotion over mm. text-based communications, where emotion may not otherwise be as easily understood. But within this, researchers are like, hey, how can we use this to, you brought up a bee, an invertebrate, right? Mm -hmm. How many biological organisms are represented within the emoji dictionary? Oh, I think about this all the time. No, you don't. Really, I, I'm not joking. I do. Really? Yes. The emoji. I wish oh, the emoji <laughs> system is fascinating to me, and how we get emojis is fascinating to me. And in case you don't know, it's there's a Unicode consortium that gets to pick which the emojis are, and all you have to do is submit one, and then really? they have to pick it. Yeah. And so Trace, you're giving me things I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. It, people wow. submit emojis all the time um, and you can submit them and then they review them. And so new emojis come from this like panel of people where you submit and say like, we need an emoji for a person who does yoga. And then they're like, okay. But then it turns out when they submitted it, they only did a person. And they're like, well, now we have all these different genders. So we need to make sure that we have a, a full picture of the person doing yoga. So now we have like three people doing yoga. And one is a, clearly a man, one is clearly a woman, and one is clearly like could be unigender or agender. And it's just so fast fascinating because yeah it's a process and it's like we end up with really weird stuff and then it's the design because the unicode consortium doesn't actually design the emojis they just it's give you else. a code for pizza and then everybody gets to pick what their pizza looks like and what's on it it's just i mean oh and i feel so like interesting and it's also i feel different between the android and the apple mm -hmm. phones so you don't have the same library you don't. You're not and you don't always the get thing. the same emotional connection between the different emotions that you're trying to send. If I'm sending this, not only is there an age difference, you know, people like <laughs> oh Gen gosh, Z and a, Gen Alpha would laugh you a, at you for using the little sideways crying laughing emoji. Ha <laughs> ha They'd be or, like, you still use even, that? What? Putting a period at the end of your sentence? What? Right. Oh, I think about this a lot, <laughs> Kiki, because <laughs> there aren't very many yeah. animals, like a variety. There are, anyway. Please continue Thanks your story. I'm so sorry much. to jump in there. Whew, I'm got all heated and spicy for it. I'm excited about your spice. It's so good because these researchers publishing in iScience and Open Access uh, Journal have been studying biodiversity communication. So communication related to science and the animals that are out there in the world through the digital era and also what they are calling the emoji tree of life which makes mm. me so excited because oh, i never cool. ever ever thought about this really i mean i just was like why do i have to just pick that little chick if i want a bird why can't i yeah. have another bird you know right. what are the options and whatever so here we are in this day and age with uh researchers who have found that there has been improvement uh, since the, you know, 2015, uh, there have been, a, has been an increase in the number of emojis that represent different phyla, represent biodiversity, and allow biodiversity communication to happen 
hmm. more easily. It's cool. pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions, like, so in 2021, they brought this up in the paper, which I think is very exciting. There was um, a uh, an effort to help highlight the urgency of protecting endangered species. And there was a Clio Health silver winning entry, extinct emojis. And on World Wildlife Day, the World Wildlife Foundation partnered with companies to make emojis depicting endangered animals that are going extinct. And when you tried mm. to use an emoji for one of those animals, it took you to a page that was like, dude, this animal's dying. <laughs> and huh. tried to educate people about these different things. Um, so it was uh, raising awareness and trying to also promote actions to help conserve different species of endangered animals. So the question is, you know, now where are we with these various species? What's, uh, you know, with the emojis, what's going on? How can we get more out there? And like you said, the Unicode, consortium like basic people can draw things can submit them and maybe we, we will get more huh. and over several years there have been more and more and more species and emojis added uh the problem is also that species are going extinct as we're adding them um mm -hmm. but this particular study which i love this tree of life because uh, yeah i love this graphic this is so cool it's so cool uh and the graphic really shows the species that were represented back in 2015, where things went, like in 2021, where things are now, and different species that have been added and who hasn't been added, and where we could possibly improve from here. But then the question is, at the end of the paper, they even admit it. It's like, okay, we'll add more animal emojis, but who how is this going to help and who who's going to be helped and what's really going to happen mm. like how do we is this really going to impact science communication is this just adding a bunch of emojis what's going to happen here right yeah i mean that's a great point most of the emojis people use are the ones that represent their emotions sort of like you started saying and so yeah duck i mean i can think of what duck is going to end up be as being meaning that's duck and crazy, you know. But at the same time, the the you need. It, I'm not saying that there are emojis that are pointless because there are emojis that, like, I'm sure no one ever uses. You know, some of them are, for example, characters that aren't in English, and maybe people don't know what those mean. So yeah. in the U.S., they're not going to use those. However, the animal ones. Most of these animals that you see in this study that they're recommending, you know, things like the orangutan or the sloth or, you know, the hedgehog or the otter, like some yeah. of these are animals that exist in various places around the world. So they're still going to be more universal than something that's like, I don't know, a water fountain emoji or whatever. Um, yeah. The I mean, get this. Emoji. I mean, surprise, surprise. Uh, Platyhelminthes. Flatworms are really not represented in emojis. Surprise. Surprise. I am shocked. <laughs> <laughs> we need a roundworm emoji. It's the most studied. Roundworms, flatworms, all the worms we need. Yeah. We need, I, we need there's a beaver emoji here. We, we need, need that. Worms. Definitely. Um, More invertebrates. That. Actually, yeah, that's the thing. If you look at this, a lot of it is. There's definitely a bias in the emojis that people are submitting, especially early on. We saw that with like the emojis that existed and, you know, not just the art work, but just which ones exist. Yeah. We bias toward mammals. We bias toward things that are cuddly or things that we like or things that we keep as pets or things that we like to look at or eat. Um, but we're not biased. We, but we need to like come out of that and try and think of animals that could be represented. I don't think there's such thing as a waste of emojis. You could search for them. We should have emojis for everything. I mean, I, I'm I'm on team all emojis all the time. Get all of them. Get At it. one time in your life that you need a polar bear emoji, you're going to find uses for it or whatever. There's going to be all sorts of uses for penguin emojis and 
All sorts of stuff. I know. When I'm like, you know, in Antarctica protecting my egg, I'm totally yeah. going to use that penguin emoji. Text your friend and you're like, Ugh, friend, what, oh, what is the dress code for this wedding? And they te text you back a penguin. Done. Message complete. You now know the dress code for this wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I could be a penguin. It'll be great. All right, everybody. If you are just tuning in, I am speaking tonight with our wonderful guest host, Trace Dominguez. He's an award winning. I mean, I'm hoping that some of his winning is going to rub off on me a little bit. Uh, science communicator, host of Animal IQ, PBS Stargazers, hosted and co-founded Seeker, worked on a lot of other projects. You're a busy guy. I mean, over the years, I've been very impressed with all the stuff that you've that you've done. I'm oh, honestly... Thanks. Yeah, and I remember first meeting you in San Francisco and going into the weird little open area and having like a sandwich salad lunch, talking about stuff while uh, you were hosting D News. Yeah. In Discovery, it was after Discovery had uh, had bought Revision 3. Um, but yeah. Back in the like, day. Back in the day, San Francisco. I sitting, know. talking about things and... <sighs> okay. I've listed things, but what are you doing? What are you excited about right now? What's happening in your life? Wow. I mean, what's happening in my life personally is I have a kid. And so I just spend <laughs> all day thinking about what I'm going to do with that. I like to think of having a kid as the greatest science experiment I'll ever do. It is. It really it's is. It's like a psych experiment. It's a biology experiment. There's definitely mold. That didn't exist before that now exists there's poop everywhere you know it's just there's just it that's a mess but it is what it is um professionally i'm doing pbs stargazers a lot um that is a weekly show it's an interstitial so it's about one minute long and every week we release uh, an episode nationwide on pbs that talks about what's going on in the sky uh, and so it's essentially a backyard astronomy or a naked eye astronomy show, which is really fun. It's been on since the 1970s. Did you know what? that? No. Yeah. What? It started in the 1970s with this kind of portly guy named Jack Horkheimer. And he was a planetarium astronomer in Miami. And if you watched PBS at night in like the 70s or 80s, this like portly dude would sit on the rings of Saturn and he'd be like, greetings, stargazers. That guy, if you remember that show from when you're a kid, if you're having like that flashback, I know I did when I first got contacted by them. That was the guy who started the show. And so it's had some astronomers since then. Yeah, hey, that's it. Um and they were having some astronomers who took over the show. And then eventually they were like, okay, we want to kind of bring in a new, fresh feel to the show. Somebody who is a little more digital native, someone who is a little more energetic, uh, I think. So that's when they, they called me because I am definitely those things. Um, so that's a big part of what energy. I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also hosting a show for them called Research Detectives, which is a medical research show. Um, we shot an episode last week that'll come out next year in February, I think, that's about superbugs, uh, which is super cool. I got to go to a fridge, uh, which doesn't sound super fun normally. But uh, so when a drug company wants to make a new drug, they usually say things like, oh, well, we can get a lot of our drug inspiration from nature. And I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I, I had in my head, like, oh, you go to the rainforest and like, you look for some compound, but I didn't know how they did that. Right. And it turns out what they would do is they'd go around the world and they'd gather soil samples, bring them back, culture what's in the sample, separate out all the different species of microbe that were in that sample. And then they, they put them in this fridge. And so I was in the fridge with all of these samples, 120,000 of them from all over the world, from Pfizer's collection, which is no longer Pfizer's because they don't make money making antibiotics. And that was really a big part of this. So that's, oh, that's one of the things like there's no money in antibiotics, but we need them. Yes. It's, and so it's, this research institution yeah. is making them. So that oh, was good. a real, okay. this is going to be a really neat episode. Yeah. That's only a small part of the episode. We talk a lot about what superbugs are because it's for an audience that's not super sciencey already. So that's, it was fascinating. I have a podcast as well called That's Absurd, Please Elaborate, where we answer silly questions with serious research or as best as we can, depending on the question. Um, 
you know, what's the pointiest thing or like, uh, you know, how long would it take to build a Lego replica of the sun or why do we use toilet paper and not, you know, where'd that come from? So we, we have a lot of different, I have a lot of different irons in the fire, as they say. All the yes, time. you do. And uh, that's absurd. That's with Julian Huguet. Correct. Also yes, of D News also slash D -News. Seeker fame. Yes. I remember meeting him there. Yeah, he's yeah. great. So, so we just released an episode are... last week Yay. with Vanessa Hill from Braincraft on YouTube. Yes. Um, Nessie. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're trying to keep busy. Why would you do that? I know. All the time. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> So, I mean, that is as, <laughs> as a science communicator, as a uh, self-employed, you're working for others, you know, contract work, you're making things yourself, you know, it's on, on your website, which is fantastic. And by the way, I really, really want to know like how to look so smiley in a photo because you're... <laughs> Your photo, you look just so happy. And <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I do my all these Matt things. Took that photo. <laughs> my friend Matt took that, and I think he probably made a joke or smi made me smile. It's nice. I think the way to get a good picture is know the guy who's taking the pictures. That helps oh, a lot. Oh, huge. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. huge. Um, but with all the things that you do, like, uh, you know, it's not just... You know, you could, you're good at marketing, you're good at communication, you're good at talking about just about anything. Um, why do you keep up the science communication churn? Why? Yeah. I mean, okay, so when I was, I don't know, I don't know how old I was. When I was maybe nine, I used to go to physics Saturdays at the University of Michigan. My parents would put me on the short bus and I'd ride the short bus to Ann Arbor and I would get to hang out with college students doing physics stuff. And it was like fun, silly things. And I loved it. I have such yeah. happy memories of like doing stuff like that. I just always liked learning stuff. And then I would go home and tell my parents about it or try and tell my friends about it. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? It's so stupid. <laughs> um, but yeah. and then like in, in school, I really liked science. The thing is, I'm, I'm not very good at math. I, I, like, I like it when I understand it. But at some point, you know, I started to get into like higher math and calculus and it started to feel more like it just you hit a button on your calculator and it does that. Yeah. Um, and that was tough for me to wrap my brain around. So I ended up shifting gears. Um, but I always liked science. And so it's just for me, it's not so much that I'm keeping up with the churn of science communication, though it is a grind. You know, it's a constant it's a constant thing. Um, but I don't know. I'm learning something new every day. And that's fun. Anytime I can learn something new, I'm happy. Um, and I know you are too, because we were just yep. talking about the emojis and the Unicode, consor Unicode consortium comes up and you're like, oh my God, new new information. Yeah, it's you like, see me, I get, I, yeah, I, get, there's, I, I get excited. Yeah, There's like an emotion connected to that feeling <laughs> yeah. of learning something new. Yeah. Uh, and I am addicted to that emotion. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm always Says trying the to find psychologist, out like the psychology major who, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's we don't always need something new. We don't need to get rid of all addictions because no. some, of, some of them are really good. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, words. I think that's why, um, the how, man, that's a whole other thing. You know, you're, when you're self-employed, uh, you know, there's, it's always, you never know what's going to happen. People are like, what's your five year plan? I'm like, what's my six month plan? I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully it still can work. I have no idea. Yeah. And things change all the time and you have to keep up with it. And I mean, the, the learning, I mean, I don't know, for me also, it's also been learning technologies and being able to keep up with the new ways of communicating and mm -hmm. do you use TikTok? To, I do not use TikTok. That I is one either. that I decided I was just not diving into. I was yeah. like, you go all you young people. <laughs> Yeah, it was just one more thing for me to learn. Yeah. And I'm like, I just spent the last 10 years learning this thing. Now you want me to learn the yeah. new thing. I'm not opposed to learning the new thing. It yeah. was just like, I don't think I was done with the old thing yet. And that's when I was like, oh, I'm old now. Not really. I'm not actually old. But you know what I'm saying? Like, that's when you yeah. first get that. The 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 conveyor belt's moving faster than you are. And you're just kind of like, okay, well, that's fine. I'm okay with that. That's cool. Like as long as other people are doing the science communication and they're continuing it. Nice. I'm happy. And I want it. it to happen in all the different places, 
right? Mm-hmm. We want it to happen in different ways. We want That's it right. to be accessible. We want it to be, you know, culturally specific so that different people find a way in. Let me give you an example of how I'm trying to do that. So oh. in Stargazers, awesome. Um, Stargazers, as we as we know, science not always been the most diverse or the most inclusive. Really? Um, really? Or as they say in some circles, stale, male, and pale. We prefer not those things uh, as much as possible. And so (laughs) when I do stargazers, a lot of a lot of stargazers has been very similar throughout the years. Not that it's the same, it's work. You have to rewrite and relook at the sky, but the sky doesn't change all that much. So that when things that you can see with your naked eye, there's a lot of repetition and doing the same stories Mm -hmm. every couple of years. Um, and so what I try and do is where they're often oh, the Greeks and the Romans have made up much of our sky mythology. I try and sprinkle in the Native Americans call this constellation this. The indigenous people in West Africa called this constellation that. It's just new information, but also reminding you that not all the constellations come from Western Europe or the Mediterranean. Some of them, yeah. you know, and reminding people that stars have Arabic names. It's not just a name that starts with AL and just happened to, and so many of them do, you know, it's because of Arabic scholars. And it's just reminding people that there's just a little bit, you know, where, where I can that, uh, and this is important because this show is commonly not watched by the youth who are more steeped in this with a variety in a variety of different ways. So I try and sprinkle it in there for the audience of, of the cotton tops and the people who are, you know, over in the double digits and then some, you know, it's like trying to do my best. Um, Not because I'm trying to be like, I don't know, convert people. It's more just as a reminder, Hey, there's more to it than, than the narrative that we've always seen. And learning is lifelong. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can look at things from a different way. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. If you find it. All right. So I'm going to tell you to stop talking about yourself right now. And tell, tell me about these skies that don't change, but there is something happening right now that we should be excited about because things did change. (laughs) Yeah. The the sky is constantly changing and also constantly not changing all the time. Um, So right now is uh, the Geminids meteor shower. Um, A meteor showers happen regularly, like all the time. Most people don't think about it, but anytime you see a shooting star, it's essentially, I like to think of it as debris on Earth's windshield. You know, we're flying through space and it's the bug that hits our windshield. That is a a meteor that we are seeing. You know, it's burning up in our atmosphere. And right now we're passing through the debris field of what's called uh, 3200 Phaeton, which is an asteroid also known as a rock comet. So it's an asteroid with a tail. Um, It's a bluish rock comet, which is pretty cool. Um, And it's rare to get a meteor shower from these. But the neat thing about it is most comets or most debris fields are dust or bits of ice. Because it's an asteroid, there's bits of rock. So it burns really brightly. Uh, So the Geminids are a really good meteor shower to see. Also in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter, which means the atmosphere is usually less humid. uh, And that's good. It's colder. You know, there's just less humidity in the air. So you end up seeing some really cool stuff. Oh, nice. Good picture. Yeah. So this is the Geminids meteor shower is one of the best in the year. Um, If you go outside anywhere in the U.S. after about, you should look to double check, but um, I base I base stargazers in Manhattan, Kansas, the geographical or close to the geographical center of the lower 48 to try and be as as broad as I can. But if you go outside after 10 p.m., you can look for Castor and Pollux, which are the twins of Gemini. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, Kiki, maybe you do, but how to find it is actually not as hard as you think. Because most people, this was the tough part when I took over stargazers, is I'm not a huge astronomy nerd. Like I wasn't, I am now. But like... I didn't know. know now how you're to do. like, I'm such. I've been really into it. Yeah, I look at the sky yeah. all the time, and I'm like, I think I know what that is, and I pull out my app, and I like try and point pinpoint where things are, all the time. Yeah. Um. So to find Gemini, look about halfway between the Big Dipper, the bowl of the Big Dipper, and the hourglass of Orion. Both are very easy to find. The Big Dipper is in the north. It looks like a spoon or a pot or a drinking gourd if you're in West Africa. 
Um, it was also been considered, you know, a cart with different people pulling the cart. Uh, and then you're going to look kind of halfway between that and the hourglass of Orion, which is that three star belt. And it does look like a very clear hourglass. It's only out in the winter. And so about halfway between you'd get that constellation of Gemini, which is two kind of sideways looking people. Um, it's pretty cool. And if you lay down on the ground and look at that part of the sky for a while, you're going to see meteors. Um, I don't know the exact uh, number of meteors per hour because th there are numbers, but you never know because every year it's different. It some could years change. are really good. Some years yeah. are not so great. Um, but yeah, the Geminids are going to be out. Until about the 17th, they're peaking, but we're still flying through the debris field even after that. So go outside, take a look, see if you can find them. They're pretty cool. So one of the things I had uh, read about the Geminids is that tonight actually is one of the peak nights. So yes. the, after the show, if people are up wherever they are, it might be a great time if your skies are clear to go yeah, take a yeah. look. If uh, we're yeah. on the West Coast... So if you're in mountain time, any time now is a good time because Gemini will be above the horizon. If you're on the East Coast, go outside. You know, if you go outside for a half an hour and look in that general direction, you will see a shooting star. I can't guarantee it, but I'm pretty confident because the Geminids you, are pretty big. And if you see a shooting star, it's probably the, from the Geminids. Correct. Yes, yeah. that's probably true. I mean, I think it's, pro it's pretty safe to say. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's, and it's a good shower like i said this is a good one there are there are showers like every month every few weeks in some cases in the year you can't always see all of them and some of them only do a few meteors but this one's yeah. a good one i live in portland oregon the pacific northwest is not great for uh clear skies but it yeah. might not be right now we've, yeah well, we'll see we'll see and maybe i i don't know yeah i keep my child up <laughs> <laughs> pull him outside in the middle of the night be like hey you're late to school because we had to look at the meteors it was yeah great. i mean once uh, there was a lunar eclipse um and my mother-in-law was visiting and she doesn't know really astronomy and she i she was woke up because i woke up at like 3 40 3 or 4 in the morning to go see it and, and she like, came what are outside you doing? and we just sat outside and chit chatted and looked at the moon and she was like, wow, that is so neat. And now she's super into astronomy. Like not, she doesn't, it's not a hobby, but she pays attention to it and like exactly. texts me about it. And it's like, that's so nice. That's and that's the cool. impact. Yeah. That's it's so cool. something, it's a great hobby. Hobbies and are easy. great. Like, like taking care of cats. We're I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> thing you don't want to do at night. <laughs> Put your cat outside. Don't put your cat outside. Just, Go watch the stars by yourself. But uh, right. yeah. Okay. We talked about. The 1950s style. Put the cat out. Yeah. Stay in the 1950s. I grew up in the country and all the cats were farm cats. Mm -hmm. Where they were there to take yeah. care of the vermin. Right. That's barn why cats. we had barn yeah. cats. Yeah. Like, we have barn cats. Yeah. Not we person. My grandpa. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's how I grew up. Like, you know, and now I'm like, what is this? cat as a member of the family this is weird but anyway <laughs> <laughs> people are like yeah a member of the family go right on outside and oh gosh what's and the research bad. this week yeah it's bad, that's bad. they just came out with a study uh this week i mean there's been a lot of studies over the years talking about cat uh cat murder uh, not the murder of cats but the cats that murder other things you know they're the there's a guy in New Zealand who actually wants to like eliminate all cats from the islands of New Zealand because they were brought by the sailors who were colonizing New Zealand and Australia. And they are invasive species that kill lots and lots, including have now made some birds uh, in the air, in the islands danger, endangered, or I don't even know if they've gone extinct yet, um, but they've endangered many of these species that only are found there, um, which right. is fascinating. Especially the flightless ground mm -hmm. dwelling birds because yeah. they're just like they're they're snackers they're instinctual hunters and they're obligate carnivores so anytime they're hungry they're going to go find something to eat and that's not always the best for wildlife um nope it turns out according to this new study that was released i saw actually picked up by the new york times and the guardian and a few other places as well uh, they eat more than two thousand species globally cats uh just the regular old house cat 
Um, nothing, no kind of special cat. And that's oh, and in the U.S. alone, they kill over one billion birds, individuals, bir individual birds, every year, every year. That's that's, a lot. that's, that's a lot of birds. That's more people than live in the like. That is that's a lot. I was like a hundred. That yeah. yeah. There's According like to their study, 350 million people who live, 330 right. million people who live in the United States, and that's like a, a yeah, bird. it's a bird. It's one bird killed for every person in the United States, and they do that annually. And more. And and the thing is, this study is most is not about uh, letting your cat out at night. Don't do that. Just don't. I don't care if your cat wants to go out. You're the you're the human. It's the cat. Leave it inside. The thing is, it's about free range cats that have already been outside. It's about farm cats and barn cats and, you know, feral cats yeah, that have escaped yeah. or have are street cats now. And they're eating, according to this study, um, 981 species of bird, 463 uh, species of reptile, 431 mammals. Um, they also eat amphibians, 57 different amphibians, and 119 species of insect. All, all from just the cats that are out in the world. That's a lot. And they put a, in this, uh, the Guardian wrote, quote, amongst the most problematic invasive species in the world. Which makes sense. Like I said, they're trying to eliminate them entirely from places like New Zealand. Wild. Wild. New Zealand makes sense to me because... Uh... New Zealand was pretty predator free and then yeah. people brought the predators. Yeah. Um, yeah. In other places, uh, we adopted these animals and we uh, allowed them to amass and we didn't take care of their population sizes. And we have like right now in Oregon, there is a new or in the Pacific Northwest, there's a new uh, uh, governmental, I guess, uh, environmental regulation that they're doing to 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 cull mm. a certain species of owl mm -hmm. because there's a barred owl that has taken over and has displaced the regionally uh, local owl. And oh, over no. the next like ten years, they're like gonna kill like five hundred thousand owls, and they're giving people permission to do it, and it's just like. <gasps> but we control that. Our government yeah. takes regulation and goes, we're going to, we're going to call deer. Yeah. We're going to let hunters yes. call owls. We're going to yeah. let, you know, the wolves have been like this huge issue. But cats, we love yeah. cats. They're we like house cats. cats. They're just They're cats. Do whatever, what do we do with them? Yeah. Cats and dogs <laughs> are difficult for humans to treat the same way. As yeah. some of these other animals, similar to our emoji story from earlier, we prefer yeah. animals that are fuzzy and cuddly and pets and stuff. And we have trouble treating them like invasive species. Um, there, There is a controversial huh. uh, plan to add cats to, like, be able to hunt them um, so that they can reduce their populations. The common solutions suggested are trapping and neutering so that their populations don't continue. Decline, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, obviously keeping your cats inside is baseline as well. That's another thing that they're really uh, encouraging. Fix your cats. Fix them. Don't let them go outside. Nope. I mean, you can and take then, them outside like on a leash or like. Or in one you know, of those like back, little space carrier, backpacks. Or backpacks. Space backpack. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. So cute. At the <laughs> farmer's so market. Oh, I love it. It's But awesome. like not outside by itself. Mm -mm. Don't let them just be free range. And then in terms of the ones that are free range, uh, we got to think about this. You got to figure out and what to do with them. Because it's impacting other species in a very negative way. Maybe so. Cruella de Vil was right. Oh, don't you even go there. <laughs> <laughs> My cat has the most wonderful chinchilla fur. Right. Just, There's some really soft no. out there. Cruella, get away from my cat. <laughs> but... <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, my God. You were good. Okay. La you wanted to tell me about uh, particle physics. And I did. we don't want to talk about this sad, what are we going to do with cats we're stories. Cats oh, kill you. everything. Okay. Don't let them outside. Let's take care of that. But... 
let's talk about something that, you know. Has a plan? Yeah, there's a plan, <laughs> a 20-year plan. I, you know, I really? don't, yeah. I, uh, here's a secret about me, Kiki, that I don't say much, but I'm going to say it now because I don't know. I just started talking. So here it comes. I'm not a huge fan of biology just across like, cause it's oozes and it's gooey and it's gross. Um, I like particle physics. It's clean. You can't get ooze on you from a hydrogen. It's just a hydrogen. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I get it. I get it. I mean, I'm, it's not I'm that a biologist. I hate I'm just, I'm just saying. It's just I don't, I don't dislike it. It's just there's always like a, there's always a cilia or like something's trying to goop on or oh. like eat or you know what you know. It's just like there's so, it's so messy. Oh, um, and Trace, I like particle just, physics. Just poke <laughs> yourself, man. Yeah, I'm squishy. <laughs> when I used I used to make people uncomfortable when I worked at a museum. <laughs> And I would, and they'd ask, because it was a museum where we had like rifles and cannons. It was a fort. And we had a bayonet and they would be like, parents would be okay, but I would always feel like they're a little uncomfortable because the kids would be like, what's a bayonet for? And I'm like, well, it's, it, they're like, it doesn't look very sharp. Stabbing and shooting. Right. And they're like, it doesn't look very sharp. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And they said, did you dull this? Like the parents were like, oh, they probably just dulled it for that. And I'm like, no, no, it doesn't have to be very sharp. And I would look at their kid or, I, or you know, their teen or whatever, and I'd poke them. And I'd be like, humans are pretty squishy. It doesn't have to be that sharp. And it's like, that would make them so uncomfortable. <laughs> and that's sometimes that's my goal. Notes <laughs> to future <laughs> museum <laughs> helpers, volunteers. Don't poke the children. Don't poke, <laughs> don't, don't poke the children. <laughs> All right. But let's poke let's physics. Let's talk about particle physics. Yeah. Yes. Something yeah. clean. Poke. poke. Something clean. It's not clean. It's yeah. so messy. It is. We don't even know. There's it's messy, so but in a different way. Oh. Uh, so every decade, a group of people meet. Um, called the P5, and they decide what particle physics in the U.S. is going to focus on, you know, like the big projects of particle physics. Uh, and they just met and they decided U.S. PARFIS is going to, uh, that's not what they call it, but I'm going to call it that, U.S. PARFIS. Uh, they're going to cut back. Uh, uh, they're going to do three, they decided three things, really, three main things. Um, they decided the what's going to happen next with Dune, which is a Movie? neutrino... Uh, a neutrino detector in North Dakota. Um, They decided what they're going to do next for the CMBS-4, which is a study of the cosmic microwave background. And they uh, decided a plan for the muon collider that they want to put in probably at Fermilab, which is pretty awesome. So let's break this down. Um, Dune, which I feel like now I should Google what Dune stands for. Because I didn't write that down in my notes. The Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. It's being yeah, built. Yeah, so it's the one, it was, it, it's like a mile underground. It's, it was an old mine. Correct. And now they've like transitioned it into this big experiment. For Yeah, this. they're on the way oh. of transitioning. It's way over budget yeah. and way behind, which is, you know. Normal. normal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah. The, the cavern, the main cavern, according to the Department of Energy, is 90% complete. So they're almost ready to like put equipment in it. And they were going to have a bunch of detectors and a bunch of different things going on. And they decided they would cut a billion dollars out of the the budget, Ouch. put fewer stuff to try and get it online sooner. Um, and in case you're not familiar of Dune's purpose or goal is it's going to get a stream of neutrinos beamed from Fermilab to where it is. Uh, in North Dakota, and it's a 1,300 kilometer long stretch of Earth. Yeah, exactly. Boom. There you go. Look at that. Perfect. So the idea is they'll be able to see if those neutrinos get messed up by going through Earth, and they can learn about what those neutrinos do uh, because they are, you know, they go through us all the time. So it's neat to be able to study them. And um, neutrinos are also the they're is, created by our uh, our uh, our nuclear uh, facilities. Neutrinos are detected; they come from cosmic events in outer space. Neutrinos are these weird things. Yeah. We, we don't know much about them. 
they yeah, don't interact with a lot of stuff. So yeah, they're really fast. Right? They're moving. They're moving through everything. They're very slippery. Yeah. Uh, they're described as slippery. Anyway, so there's um, the Japanese have a hyper kamiokande, which is going to come online in 2027. Yes. Uh, and that is a problem for the American Parfids people because they want Dune to be the one that to discover stuff. And if Kamiokande, Hyper Kamiokande comes on in 2027, Dune's current plan is to not receive neutrinos till 2031. And they're like, oh no. No. That we gives can't. them four years to like try and neutrino ahead of us. We can't get behind. Yeah. Never Otherwise, mind that we've we already got thing? Ice Cube. But right. What, 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 that giant, cool looking thing yeah. that I would love to visit. I want to <clears> too. So much. Oh, I've been to CERN twice. It's like science Disneyland there. So cool. Uh, but I'm anyway, so that's Dune. Okay. They're gonna cut they're gonna cut back on Dune, trying to get it starting up sooner. Okay. Number two item, Great. CMBS four, which is twelve different telescopes around the world stretching from the Atacama Desert to I can't remember where. Uh, and it'll it'll they're gonna study the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, for seven to ten mm -hmm. years to try and get like high res pictures, basically, like a high res. Uh, scan of the CMB from different parts of the world, which is going to be really neat. CMB is cool. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's basically the oldest light in the universe. Once upon a time, we listened to radios and had television stations that didn't actually transmit broadcasts, and you could hear it. Static. Oh, cool. So satisfying, really. Now, yeah. I almost miss it. <laughs> anyway I do. I'm like trying to find pictures of it but I guess it's pictures yeah. of static no or the cosmic microwave <laughs> background <laughs> no <laughs> of the CMB as four I was trying to find something that would be oh yeah like, there's nice. a cmb-s4.org yes there's a, yep, yes, there it is. There's you a got website it. you Nailed can find it. information so yeah yes. this is uh that picture is the, that you see if you google the CMB you're going to get like a little oval with some red and blue and it kind of looks like a like a map a weird, of the earth almost weird heat um, map yeah, yeah like a heat map it's super tiny temperature fluctuations in the cmb most of it is it's about the same very very cold temperature uh even the graph here shows you it's like negative 300 micro kelvin to 300 micro kelvin <laughs> so it's like real, real, that's a real close in temperature <laughs> <laughs> to everybody except for scientists. So it's going to just have really high res pictures of the CMB and hopefully we can learn some stuff about the early universe, which is awesome. Uh, and then finally okay. a muon collider in the US, which anybody who's still reeling from the shutdown of the superconducting super collider in Texas, <laughs> which I know we all are still upset about it. Uh, <laughs> that <laughs> they're going to build a muon collider, they think. Um, they think maybe they, think they would like to. What's the timing uh, on that? I don't know. They didn't you say in, their, in the thing in the things that I read. I'm sure it says it somewhere, but they weren't emphasizing the that that it was being built now. They were just like, no, this is the plan. We they should build it. one. Uh, nobody else seems to want to build one um, except for like CERN wants to build one, but they want to build it basically the same thing that they've already got, the LHC. They want to like dig a bigger ring and do this. And they're like, oh, but what if we built one that's just for muons? Right. So a muon is a lepton. Yeah. So it's in the same family as the electron. Uh, the electron is 200 times lighter than a muon. Um, leptons are not affected by the strong nuclear force, uh, which is cool. So basically... If they can find and study muons, that would be cool because they have a two hundred or two point two microsecond lifetime, uh, so they're very short lived, unlike protons and electrons. Um, but you'd need a ten tera electron volt collider to find it, which is that's a lot. That's a, that's a lot. That's big magnets. Big magnets. Yeah. Like yeah. Lots so of stuff working. Yeah. They could build. They think one at Fermi Lab. It would be a sixteen kilometer circle which would fit within Fermi Lab, So they could build it without having to like buy new land and find a new place for it and deal with all of that regulation. They can just do it right on the Fermi Labs property. Uh, that which would is be a real awesome. plus. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge plus. Yeah. Uh, and if we can learn more about muons, uh, all of these things 
are to answer their question for their 20 year plan, which is how does the universe work? Seems pretty broad uh, to me, but hey, look, everybody <laughs> needs a plan. It's important to have a plan. Uh, how does the universe work? Good a plan as any. Good job, American physicists. <laughs> Go physics. Yes. Well, I mean, this is, a, I feel like American physics, uh, we have the National Ignition Facility that mm -hmm. it, it really got its money because of nuclear warhead science yeah. they say oh we're gonna you know we're gonna do fusion it's gonna be great it's gonna be awesome whatever um but yeah a lot of the physics that we have funded has been related to defense it's been related to other political reasons it hasn't mm -hmm. been just for basic science it hasn't been to understand and we have watched other countries we've been a part of CERN's efforts, the LHC. We've yeah. been a part of, um, you know, other efforts around the world. But at the same time, after the super colliding super collider was basically defunded. Yeah. It, American particle phys physics, like Fermilab is kept going, but like pretty much the advancement of American particle physics just halted. Yeah. Yeah. And so to see that they're potentially putting together a multi-decade plan i know agreed it's exciting That's because exciting. if you have a friend who does particle physics and you like to see your friend happy <laughs> just in general you like to physically see them in person it's going to be tough because they're going to have to leave the country to go do particle physics right, right? it's just yeah. we don't really have facilities here for that nope. we're not interested in funding basic science and at the end of the day, mm. discovering what's going on with the CMB, discovering how neutrinos work, you know, discovering like what a muon does when it's alone in its apartment like that. You got to really want to know that stuff. You can't be like, oh, we're going to use this to build a bigger whatever, you know, bomb. So so this gun. group, this physics, particle physics project prioritization, prioritization panel. So they they come together these dudes that come together and they come up with plans. Yeah. And now the next step is they've got a plan and they have to sell it to Congress, right? Is that the next, they, the next step is going to be funding or is it all? You know, is, that's a is, great is, question. Let me see here. It looks like their 2014 go? report was a constant funding. And then let me see. So their process, no mass, yeah, they're in the same place. The outcomes, they you struggle to reunite around future plans in 2021. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> but I don't know. I would assume yes, because the Department of Energy is part of this, and they were are yeah. quoted in, like over and over in these studies or in these uh, reports that I read. But I don't know where this goes now, other than I think it's like, it's not a regulatory body. It's more just mm -hmm. like, hey, these are a bunch of physicists. This is the stuff we should focus on. Yeah. And they're now working to get those grants. And likely, yes, from the Department of Energy, from DARPA, from whomever they can go get money from to try and fund what they're doing. So they have this, like, organized system. Right. And also not a brain drain. Yeah. The brain drain is real, man. Like It's real. It would be awesome if we could have, like, imagine if in, I mean, it, it's in Texas is where the superconducting super collider was. But imagine if in Texas, the superconducting super collider was bringing scientists from all over the world for the last 30 years to yep. Texas. Would Texas be a different place? Maybe. Yeah. I could say Yes, I don't think it would be. It like, may I'm not just be gonna say yes. It may not, you know. I'm not saying politically or even culturally, but I'm saying generally speaking, Texas would be a different place because you would look worldwide and they would say, "Cool, where are we going to go to learn about the next stage of the universe?" And they'd be and like, "People oh, would be Texas. going there." Right now, yeah. you think Geneva, which that's not a bad thing. Geneva's cool. It's got a big old fountain. The food is fine, but like, you know. It's near the Alps. We're eating barbecue to right. celebrate the Higgs boson. <laughs> but we're not. And line dancing. And the, yeah. yeah. And that was a decision that we made, unfortunately. We could do better. We I'm can do better. It's really, I think, I think uh, it's exciting. I mean, this is the, this is the place mm -hmm. where science vision, science experiment, like the experiments 
that people want to do and science communication with the public actually mm -hmm. comes really into play because yeah. this is the whole, this is, this is where it all lines up. I love that. You're going to make it. Yeah. We're going to make it happen. Someone, someone's going to do Let's build a thing. Let's build a thing. We got to tell the story of how exciting it's going to be. And then the people will go, yeah, let's do it. And the politicians will go, oh, I'll give you the money. And then everybody's building and then it's happy. And you don't end up with like weird tunnels under your state. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but I have to say, I love like when I'm not doing science communication stuff, I like to look at like abandoned buildings kind of pictures and videos Wait, and stuff. Where did we, where did the world used to be? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Kind of like, oh, this urban decay abandoned abandoned building Instagram is my favorite. And like the pictures of the superconducting super collider from people who've like snuck in and taken pictures of it. Pretty was pretty cool. I mean, it's sad, but it's so cool. It's so cool. I don't know if you know this, but I have a map uh, where I grew up in California was one of the possible locations for the superconducting super collider. And it was going to go like almost exactly underneath the property that my family's owned for like 150 years. Cool. And I've got I have this map. It's huge. It's like eight feet, six feet by, by eight feet. But it's this massive map of where they proposed putting it in California. And then Moved my it. mom, my mom was very active against it. So mm -hmm. California's <laughs> got the NIMBYs. We got them. Well, I mean, I mean we, we couldn't have lived in our house anymore. So, I mean, you couldn't have. <laughs> they wouldn't have just dug a tunnel and been like, you're fine. You're fine. It's great. It's no problem. Whatever. In Geneva, they just have like cows and stuff. You literally like come out of the LHC, you come up an elevator into a big building, then you get in a van, you have to drive by all these cows and farm fields and like Not to get people. to the next building. It takes forever. Don't, don't eat cows from Geneva. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. No wonder the food's not great. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm telling stories, everybody. What do I know? Okay. I this is This Week in Science. We're closing up the show here really soon. If you really, really love what we're doing here, please become a Twist supporter. It's with your support that we continue on. So head over to twist.org, click on the Patreon link. The Patreon link will take you to Patreon, where you can choose your level of support, $10 and more a month. And I will thank you by name at the end of the show. And I really, really, really want to like be out of breath and have a problem finishing the list of names honestly. So that would be super helpful. Um, we also have other packages where you get t-shirts and stickers and other things as well. Right now, we also have the Twist 2024 Blair's Animal Corner calendar that is available on our Zazzle store. So if you go to twist.org, click on the Zazzle link, you'll be able to go through the store, find the calendar, and get yourself an awesome calendar for 2024, order it for friends. We also have a lot of other really neat things that are made by Blair that are Blair's original art of animals and it's just really cool stuff that make great, great sciencey cool gifts and it's holiday season, so. Every little bit helps. And also, we really just appreciate you being here. And we hope that you share the show with people you love this holiday season. Can't do it without you. Thank you for your support. I'm a patron. Uh, you're a patron. I'm a patron. Yay. Yay. Hey, thank you, Trace. You're welcome. <laughs> I have thank two you. more stories. Oh. <gasps> Are you okay with that? Let's do it. Or, or do you want to eat Taco Bell? I'll just order the Taco Bell really quick. <laughs> okay. Give me a second. I'll order the Taco Bell. Okay. And then it'll show up. And then you'll be like, yeah. And I'll have the tacos. I'm done with I'm done with the show. I got the tacos. Everything yeah. is good. Everybody's happy. It is the way that it works. Okay, here we go. Delivery. <laughs> tacos. Oh, my goodness. That's On it. That's air. all I got to do. I'm doing, doing it right okay. now. Okay. First things first, we didn't just map the mouse brain. We're also giving them VR. <gasps> Can you imagine how cute their little headsets would be? 
Oh, <laughs> no. no. So oh, wait, no, it's not cute. No, I don't have to imagine it because they've posted pictures. <gasps> well, That's illustrations. Not cute at all. It's horrifying. <laughs> 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 Oh, no. They've, they've illustrated what their immersive VR setup is. Uh, what their paper this past week in Neuron is, is full field of view virtual reality goggles for mice. Historically virtual. Oh, wait, what am I showing right now? Oh, oh that's an ad. Close that up. Yeah. Hey, oh, there. I don't want to sell Audis. Uh, I just want to tell you about this. Immersive miniature rodent stereo illumination VR that is small ish, provides yeah. stereo vision and an about 180 degree field of view per eye. These uh, goggles that they have created that are like big skylights or portholes <laughs> for each side of the mouse head. Um, are a little bit better than previous iterations of VR because historically uh, it's just been putting the mouse in a situation where there were uh, big screens in front, like a like an IMAX theater. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So it's the difference between an IMAX theater and VR goggles is what they're trying to look at right now and they're hoping that they can simulate common occurrences in nature like hey mouse here's an owl attacking you um they're trying to make or create realistic situations that could uh, allow us to understand how the mouse brain works responding to natural situations but at the same time giving that control that uh, researchers love to have. Um, <clears throat> part of the way that this system works is that the mouse is connected to the, uh, the setup. So similar to like, like old, uh, old school brain research, you have to isolate the movements of the head so the head doesn't move. Mm -hmm. So there are implants in the head and in the neck of the animal mm -hmm. um, so that they can be attached to the apparatus. So they can't turn their head anywhere. They're just, their head is immobilized while they're in this goggle situation. Um, but then they are on a rolling treadmill to get an idea oh. of how the animals uh, are would react, whether they would want to run away, whether they would fight, flight, flee, or huh. freeze, right? Wow. So in the situation, they basically were testing for this immersive uh, technology, whether or not it's better than previous VR type technologies slash IMAX. Um, and they determined that what they were working on, it uh, is more exact, that the uh, mice are seeing things that are more realistic, that are more intimate, that the brain reacts in a more uh, specific real world manner <laughs> than with the uh, kind of IMAX version that has been used historically. So. Is this an advance for the study of mouse biology? Maybe. Um, I don't know. Hmm. I, 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 was a, uh, I, I was a bird ethologist for a long time, trying to come up with situations to, in a lab to make birds react normally within a lab situation. Uh, so I understand what's happening here, and especially if you're trying to map neuronal responses at the same time that you're looking at behavioral responses um, you need to have some kind of isolation but it's an advance mice yeah. get vr interesting mm. yeah why, why though why why just to learn about their brains to learn how they react to stuff have it, more control during experimentation yeah, because, I mean, how often are you around when a mouse is being attacked by an owl? Right. 
And then you can learn about how their brain works during that and what. Yeah, what systems are activated, what genes are expressed, how the, you know, how everything works together. And so if we're talking about like the using animals to not just understand how they're responding, but also for the future of understanding anxiety and mm -hmm. fear responses, um, how do in we... In ourselves, yeah. In, yes, yeah, absolutely. So well, I hope they enjoy the VR, even if it's somewhat terrifying. Yeah. And thank goodness <laughs> when we are doing VR, it's just elastic headbands that put that thing on our head and we don't have to have our heads isolated. It can be terrifying though. I don't like it. Sometimes. I'm not a I'm not a VR person. I don't like it that much. I'm not either, but I gotta do it because I'm making stuff with VR. Well, God. you gotta if you're doing so. I get it. Last story, uh, brain computers. So oh. uh, yes, you mentioned Star Trek Voyager earlier. And uh, Star Trek Voyager was a, a special vessel because it was biologically created. Mm -hmm. So it was an integration of biological and yeah. non-organic uh, components, right? Right. So is this our future? I don't know. Researchers just published their study in neuro... Wait, 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 where did they publish it? In Nature Electronics. There we go. Um, of, <laughs> it's not software. It's brain-aware. Mm, brain-aware. Brain-aware. That's literally it, what it's called. It's, <laughs> the Brain-aware Project. Yes. That's, Why do they let scientists name things? <laughs> really shouldn't. Why? Why? Yeah. The mouse VR... What's it called? You want to know? It's it was called... immersive. I, little I, big Ooh. M R S I V, pronounced immersive. Right. Why do they let scientists name things? Because they don't talk to us enough. <laughs> 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 we should. Uh, so, in this study, these researchers created a hybrid system of brain organoids and also a computer chip. So, they yeah. used. Uh, brain stem cells to create an organoid. Organoids are a mass of multiple cell types that can uh, be analogous to brain tissue, not flat in a Petri dish, but like more of an organ, right? Mm -hmm. uh, connected them to a computer chip and then allowed them to, or with the chip, gave it an AI learning system. Uh, so this was not just a neural network, but a bio neural network exploring the potential of bio computing. Neat. Yeah. Uh, so they looked at it specifically in regards to speech recognition. They were looking at Japanese speech patterns uh, and looking at the decoding of audio clips of Japanese vowels. Uh, this research was uh, from Indiana University Bloomington, and they uh, were able to set up this system in such a way that it's not as good as AI, like ChatGPT mm. and these other things, but it, with training and learning, they had uh, speech recognition to about 78% accuracy. Hmm. That's pretty good. I mean... Not as good as, I guess it's like some of the neural neural computing whatever networks that we have now, machine learning networks. But it's pretty good for a little for a little teeny, well okay. teeny brain, little tiny brain cells in a little ball attached to a chip and sending receiving data um, and actually adapting and learning based okay. on. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's an AI tool that they used. There was learning that occurred through the chip and the organoid as well. Uh, these organoids can't perceive speech, but they respond to the impulses mm -hmm. from the audio clips. So they can perceive differences in the impulses of the audio clips is hmm. what's happening in this situation. I can, yeah, I can also perceive differences in audio clips. So <laughs> we're basically the same. Like the same. You're Basically so brain aware. Yeah. Brain aware. Brain aware. Brain aware. 
I find it, I find it fascinating because like you said, you're like, oh, biology, it's messy. It's gross. It's gross. But at the it same time, on you. the human brain is one of the best information processors, pattern recognition mm -hmm, mm -hmm, processors mm -hmm. that yes. we know of. Yeah. Better than all of the computer computing power we have, the brain is is better in many yep. ways. And we don't know why. You're right. And so we're trying to figure all that out. We're trying to create these systems that could mimic brain function. Uh, cool. Which is cool, but also scary. But at the same time, you know, <sighs> will we live in a future where we have messy computers, where they are... Mm bio silicon or, you know, where there's, you know, there's some kind of organic aspect to the, the processing because of the way that neurons and their supporting cells work together to process information that a computer doesn't. Yeah. More lateral thinking, I guess, or like the ability to at least exceed, uh, to use like matrixy type language, like exceed its right. programming kind of a situation. I don't know. That's neat. Yeah, uh, and, you know, and, I, and I then said your computer's that, like, am I like a blue pill or what am I taking? Yeah. <laughs> I said earlier that I wouldn't do bio like I, biology and I aren't friends. But if I were going to go get a PhD, it would be in neuroscience because that's freaking really fascinating. I would I would get over my oozy biology stuff to study this little bowl of fat in my head like that'd be pretty cool. And we would welcome you. I would love it. The neuroscience. Like, It'd be so fun. Join us. It'd be so fun. It would be so fun. I think it's really interesting. You say you'd like to do neuroscience. I studied neuroscience. I would like to do more um, psychology and mm. like more of the yeah, that side of yeah. things. I think yeah. the, the I mean, brain and behavior. That's great when you have a kid, let me tell you. Oh, best experiment ever. Just don't be upset about any results. You just got to let it be. Nope, not. Yep. I, my 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 dad's like no you know, bias. you can't control him right and i'm like i do yeah. i do know that but i can control how i react oh you've already become yes you've got it down <laughs> parenting <laughs> you fail one. a lot as parents too oh gosh all the time so much you have to be cool with that i'm already cool with it i make videos for the internet it's all about learning <laughs> 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 yeah, you got it. Yes, I'm used to this. Comments. It's fine. I'm good at being bad at stuff. <laughs> I can handle YouTube comments. I can be a parent. That's right. Totally There's great. Nothing he could say. Come <sighs> right to me. Oh, Trace, it's I've too... kept you up too late, though. You, oh, you need, I know. I gotta need... go to bed because he gets up at seven thirty. I know. You need to have baby bedtime and and taco eating. And so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight. It's been really fun, and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. This was great. I want to come back. Oh, I come back. yay. Let me I know when, you come. I only know when you need me. I'll come back, and we'll do it yes. again because this was fun. And it was a nice – It was. I don't always get to get – so when we did D News, as you know, we were like all up on what was happening in the in the science news space all the time, and I've been out of – doing i try and keep up with it just for my own interests i have a little yeah. running spreadsheet but it was so fun to have to like dive into my old rss feeds and find all this cool fun stuff <laughs> learn all about it so you're like i can me. learn things it was so fun yes. i'm so i'm sad it's over already i can't believe it's been oh my gosh it's been almost two hours i can't believe i know it. and i was it like hey by. yeah totally i'll it'll be an hour yeah no problem no way <sighs> I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag sorry, not sorry. Okay, where can people find you on the internet? Um, if you search for Trace Dominguez, you will find me. I'm the only one in the world, as far as I know. Um, I haven't met another one. Uh, and uh, you can find me on threads at Trace Dominguez. You can find me on YouTube at Trace Dominguez. You can find me on Instagram at Trace Dominguez. I tried to get all of them. If you don't know how to spell Dominguez, Google it. Uh, Google will tell you. It's really easy. Um, but generally, yeah, that's my that's my deal. You can also find me on my website or on my podcast, tracedominguez.com. So website, the podcast, if that's absurd, please elaborate. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. If that is not true, please tell me so, so I can put it there. 
uh, but I'm pretty sure I got it everywhere. Our biggest audiences are Spotify and Apple, of course. So we're everywhere. Yeah. We try so hard. There's so many places now. It's like, wow, this is different than the directories of the old days. But yeah. Oh, also, if you don't get Stargazers in your local PBS station, PBS would want me to tell you PBS South Florida makes it interesting story about PBS real quick. There are 200 PBS stations and they don't really know each other except for, you know, professionally they do. But it's not like so Nova is made out of WGBH Boston and they yes. dump it into the PBS basically pool of content and all the right. other PBS stations can use it. Right. PBS South Florida does the same with our show. So it might not air in your region, but if you want to see it, Write an email to your local PBS station and have them pick it up so you can learn about astronomy at night in your that's, area. That's wonderful. That makes it easy. Go ask for it, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. My mom emails our PBS station all the time, and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that guy. I, 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 really? I don't know. Stars, trays, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thank you for having me on. This was so fun, and I would love to do it again. And it was nice to see you in the chat, all of your chat people. Thanks for all your comments. Some of whom you recognized. So that's I right. That. I know some of these yeah. people. Like Ben and Gord. Back in the day. Yeah. Back so in awesome. the day. So good. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope you all enjoyed the show. Fada, thank you so much for your help with social media and show notes. Gord. R and Laura, others, thank you for making sure that our chat rooms are happy and nice to each other because that's what we like. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. And as always, I must thank my Patreon sponsors. Oh, this is going to be fun. Thank you to Aaron Anathema, Car Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northcote, Rick Gloveman, Re George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratrasombi, Carl Kordfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vagard Chefstad, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylard, Ali Cothman, Reagan Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, Oops, P.I.G., Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshack, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack Bryan, Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Carowood Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, G. Burton, Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramis, Paul, Philip Shane, Curse Larson, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Nappy, O. Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Beccararo, and Tony Steele. Yay! Oh, I ran through just a few little stumbles on this week's reading, but thank you, all of you, for your support on Patreon. And if there's anyone out there who's not supporting us on Patreon yet and you want your name on that list, make sure you head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. <sighs> we can't do it without you. On next week's show, I don't know what's going on. I haven't figured it out yet. I'm just going to be honest. It's the 20th. It's right before the holidays. I got to talk to uh, Justin and Blair and find out when we're going to do our year-end countdown of stories and how we're going to make that work. But we are always back Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube, our Facebook, our Twitch. And uh, you can find other information at twist.org slash live. If you want to listen to us as a podcast, search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. And if you like it, share it with your friends because and get them to sub subscribe because that's how we do this thing with the podcasting and the streaming and everything that you're sharing helps anything you've heard here is also going to be available in our show notes at our website, twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter, which I do send out every once in a while. If you have an idea for an interview, a topic, or anything else you want us to address, email me, Kirsten, at, Kirst, uh, at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. It was just their birthdays, so maybe send them some birthday emails. That might Ooh. be fun. I don't know. Make sure you put twist somewhere in the subject line so your email does not get spam filtered into a defunded super colliding super collider and end up in some politician's spam box. You can also find us on the social medias. At Twist Science is usually where Twist is found. 
I'm Dr. Kiki at Jackson Fly is Justin and at Blair's Menagerie is where you find uh, Blair. Trace, do you have social media handles? Yes, at Trace Dominguez. All my things. There you I am go. on the X app, but I don't use it. I mostly use threads and blue sky. And yeah. I do have a mastodon, but I don't use it that much. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're I'm sorry. all too. I know trying. mastodon. I'm sorry, people. I tried. And we're YouTube trying. and everywhere else. We're trying so hard. Yes, we love your feedback. So do try and keep in touch. We will be back here again next week because I'm pretty sure it's on the calendar and I just told you that I will be. So please join us again for some more great science news. And if you learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. <laughs>